Mr. Johnson has brought a couple of artifacts. He's got a personal story he'd like to share with us. And continuing that depth of culture, and just what a fascinating experience we've got. Sir? Good evening. Um, I didn't uh, plan on speaking tonight. I just brought in a couple of artifacts that uh, my father, who was in the Army, uh, stationed with uh, the AmeriCal Division. And then uh, before that, he was with the, uh, the uh, first cab. He made uh, four, three, three amphibious landings. Um, the first one was in Bougainville, Luzon. Um, let's see, the third one. Uh, Cebu, which is a, was a naval base. And then to the final occupation of Japan. Um, the first thing that I brought in Point right on here. Hold this for you. All right. you describe it. Um, this is called a, a, a Senabari belt or a thousand stitch belt. Um, what would happen is the soldier would approach um, anyone and everyone to say a prayer for them and then make a stitch in this belt. Then the belt was put right around their midsection and that was to keep them invincible, obviously. This one didn't work so well. Um, anyway, that's that's behind that, and his name is is on the inside. Um, I could keep these up here for a little bit afterwards. You can get a really uh, much closer look. Um, the second one is a is a, a a personal flag that each soldier would have. A lot of times they were either again if they didn't have the Cinnabari belt, they would fold these, put them around their waist again. Um, you'll see a lot of them have. Uh, signatures by friends, relatives, and then on this one it has uh, two stamps which are, um, I guess they would be like shrines or temples where they would, where they would take this and uh, their, a prayer would be said for their, uh, their well-being. And obviously that didn't work so well for that one either. But anyway, um, The two cultures were very, very different, and the little bit that my dad would talk about it, um, he first of all said, it was a very dark time in my life, and really only after he had, we had a couple of beers, my brother and I, and my dad would talk, um, would he open up a little bit about this war. Um, They, uh, they had to do all different kinds of things. There was a different sort of, uh, almost like guerrilla warfare. Um, they, would, they, would, they were a smaller race. They would uh, take and strap themselves into trees at night, palm trees. And uh, then when the troops would, uh, let's say, go out for um, meals, go to the latrine, they would pick them off. So then it became routine policy before they had rally for their meals. They would just hit the tree line with a, a bunch of bullets and invariably somebody or some rifle or something would fall out because they would literally tie themselves in there because they would fall asleep. So they tied themselves in. So a lot of times they never even fell. Um, they would they would sneak up, uh, actually they would, they would hide themselves in these little, almost like a trapdoor spider hole that he talked about that had kind of a little lid on it and um, the troops would advance over it not seeing it and then they'd shoot him in the back. Well, they got smart to that too. Um, they had a little device there that was mentioned earlier, I believe it was, uh, it was called a knee mortar and it was the farthest thing from a knee mortar. but. Uh, my dad says that was just a wonderful little piece of equipment. One guy, he carried a belt full of these, uh, this ordnance, and uh, they tried to get a hold of them, and uh, they, they did, they used them. The, the, the beauty of it was is that one guy was a mortar team, and our mortar took three guys, one for the base and one for the tube, and then one for the ordnance. And, uh, the beauty of it was is they could move. They were they were just random. They could set it down, boom, fire a few rounds, and uh, that would be the end of that. They could never get a bead on where these fellows were. So that was a that was quite a little instrument of death. 
Um, you talked about at night, um, if you've ever done any camping out at night under the stars and you hear the, the crickets and stuff, it's like white noise. These fellows would fall asleep to the white noise of the crickets. When those crickets stopped, you knew somebody was coming in. And then they hit a white flare, and sure enough, the, the Japs would be sneaking in a lot of times just with bayonets and to get the guys in the foxholes. So anyway, that, that, was a, that was one thing that they learned real quick as well. The other thing is, is that, one other thing that my dad said that they could tell when the Japs were sneaking up on them at night was that they could smell them. A lot of these fellows, I don't know if anybody has seen um, that movie, Letters from Iwo Jima. But these poor guys, they, they hadn't showered in like over a year. So you could just imagine. So they, they knew that too. They had a different philosophy of, of fighting as been brought out. Um, surrender was, was totally unacceptable and uh, they just wouldn't quit. Um, my dad served, well they found out, I guess according to his uh, draft papers before the war that he was drafted, he was a, uh, he spray painted file cabinets at uh, Shaw Walker right over here. So what do you think he did for a while? Spray tanks, trucks, jeeps. Well, they need a BAR man, Browning Automatic, heavy duty weapon support weapon. So what does that do? That draws an awful lot of enemy fire because you're putting out the most bullets. Rather hazardous. Well, we now need medics. You're a medic now, Mr. Johnson. So they put them through medic, through, put them through, uh, medic school. They had a red cross, front, back, all four sides. And he told me, he said, that was like putting a bullseye on his helmet. Two reasons. One, the Japs figured that that would be very demoralizing to take out one of these medics. Number two is that if they took him out, he might be able to save seven, ten, whatever troops that were maybe be wounded that could still continue on and continue to fight. So uh, he didn't care for that either. He turned down Sergeant Stripes towards the end of his uh, tour. And I asked him, why did you do that? Why, you know, higher rank and pay and all of that. He said, it just brought more bullets to you. They saw the stripes and they saw the rank. We're gonna take out a sergeant. So uh, he turned that down as well. And uh, it, was a, it was a dirty mess over there. And he talked very, very little about it. But uh, I think we have to have a very very a lot of a lot of respect for the people that were over there that that, that suffered through that the heat and the bugs and he said there was a little uh, yellow spider he said kill more guys than you could imagine and uh, they always kicked their boots out if they ever took their boots off always kick your boots off and tap them against something because invariably something would crawl out or fall out and so that was another those are all things that they learned real quick and uh, I, I can't think of it anymore. I just said um, it was it was a mess, and we, we were losing. We were losing that war until we really got we stepped up. They were they were they were losing out because he had to fill in the ranks of the Miracal Division, which was was pretty well decimated. We're gonna win tonight, damn it! We're going to Midway. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>